the title of my talk is Staying Relevant with Your Specialty Food. And um, really, it is all about key considerations when exploring whether your brand should take on a food trend. And so I'm here to just ask you a ton of questions and make you search your own souls. Um, and really, it's because um, as a food scientist and product developer, I've been fortunate to be part of the launch of several really interesting products. And um, so these are questions that I've had to ask myself um, within the company and even friends who connect me with entrepreneurs. I try to ask these questions of them pretty early on as well because um, the more questions and answers we ask and answer up front, the fewer headaches you're gonna have down the road or you'll just run into different headaches down the road. So, <clears throat> oh. hello. So food trends. You're all here for different food trends. And so I asked um, some friends from Data Essential and the Hartman Group to send me information about the top trends that they've seen for 2019. And these slides will be shown at different um, trade shows through the year. I keep hitting the button, there's a fourth. There we go. Um, and so you've probably seen a lot of this. And honestly, a lot of you here are from brands that are pushing these trends. And um, so thank you for making our lives very interesting. Um, and so I'm just going to go through these slides really quickly to show you kind of what um, the major data organizations are saying about trends. Um, heart health, functional foods, you're going to see that there's a big emphasis on um, enjoying the food that we're eating, absolutely, and um, having it be good to our bodies. That I think is a push that the younger generation of consumers really goes for. The other is um, prepared meals. Um, our generations are a lazy bunch. We're also a very busy bunch. And so, um, you, you know, prepared food is something that's so much bigger now than it was 10 years ago. I was in a food startup 10 years ago that was doing home meal replacement and we did not survive the recession. Um, but it was sort of like this and it was like, oh, I was, one of, I was in one of those businesses that was ahead of its time, yay. So, um, and then here's the last slide as far as trends go. I know I flew through these. Um, I'm sure they'll be available online somewhere, or you can come to the peasonmoss.com uh, website and get the slides as well. Um, but here's some other trends, and I actually worked for Bulletproof 360. That's one of the trends with the 5% at the bottom. Um, and so I've, I've gotten to be part of legacy foods and um, foods that have a long heritage in the industry, and then some of the uh, companies that are really kind of trend pushers and um, boundary pushers, I guess, is what I mean. Um, so if you have launched any products to the market, you know that you um, work with a cross-functional team. Either if you're a five or fewer person show, you might be wearing all of the hats. Um, but ultimately, you're in a cross-functional team and you're part of that team. Ideally, you'd have a single goal that you're pushing for, but you should be playing different roles. And if you have someone else in your team who's playing exactly the same role, one of you is in the wrong meeting. <laughs> um, and, and really, your priorities should be complementary. And I'm not saying that they're the same, right? Because each of us in the team has different priorities. We're um, kind of scaling up at different times. When I'm super busy in R&D, our sourcing team is really busy, but our procurement team isn't quite as busy because we haven't quite gotten to where we're ordering pallets and truckloads of products, right? Um, the other piece, you know, with how a cross-functional team is built is look at all of these different job titles that are in a cross-functional team, and in my opinion, are absolutely necessary. So again, for the, the uh, food startups, you're not going to be able to hire a dozen people for your company, probably. Um, but the one thing I would offer to you with this is um, know when you should not just be adding a hat to your own head and actually adding a head count. Does that make sense? So um, I do not love logistics. I can play around at it and then drive my supply chain guys bananas, but the better thing would be bring them into the conversation directly, right? Um, and if you are, again, if you're a 10 or fewer company, you're not gonna be able to hire all of these people, but there are industry experts out there. There are consultants who can help, you know, targetedly support in one area or they can be kind of turnkey for you. So don't feel like you're going at it alone. There are 20,000 people here who are, who have done this. So, um, you know, access that network. So the um, title of the slide I've somehow managed to delete, but it was called strategic fit. 
And um, that was, it's the first question that you should have for your brand identity. Is the trend that you're considering part of your strategic, str really? Strategy, let's try that. Um, and you know, so I come from Bulletproof and um, we're uh, a branded ketogenic diet. We get associated with paleo and um, CrossFit and other um, trends and activities. But Bulletproof has chosen not to go into every single part of that trend because it's not core to who we are. So that's what I would ask you. If you're considering um, plant-based protein alternatives or if you're considering you know, changing your packaging because you know, a new package trend is coming forward, a new technology is there, does it actually make sense for you to be associated with it? Consumers are going to associate you regardless, but you can drive how that association happens. So. And then think, what will you gain from this? If you're going into a new category for your brand that's logical to your consumer, what are they expecting? Um, is this going to introduce you to a new market? Is it going to help someone who wouldn't have used your product before you start using it? If not, why are you going into it? Okay, so now you've decided, okay, we're going to get onto uh, food trend X. Now let's talk about the product scope. And this is where R&D scientists go to die. And we do a lot of crying in this space. Um, and this is where silos will be the death of you because if I write a product description and I'm guessing what my risks are and I'm thinking about the costs and the claims, and claims, I should talk about that, nutrition claims, without claims, um, with claims, know those up front because there's nothing more heartbreaking than getting most of the way through your product development cycle and then realizing you were supposed to be organic certified. You literally have to start over and it will not taste at all the same. Organic lime and conventional lime taste completely different, so don't fall in love with the wrong ingredients. Um, any one of these pieces that gets skipped um, will cause your finished product to fall apart either in market or when your sales team is trying to present it. So make sure when you get your cross-functional team together, make sure each of them is giving you a bullet point for each of those categories so you can consolidate it and say, oh, cool, okay, you thought it was gonna be this, you thought it was gonna be that, we're gonna bring it together in the middle, right? Okay, market attractiveness. This is a picture from fancy food, winter fancy food, and um, there are a lot of people and there's a lot of product there. So once you've thought about the trend that you're wanting to be part of, that you believe is really a good strategic fit for your brand, think about where that market is actually going. Look at the data, call your trend folks often because it changes often, right? We're getting more and more information. Consumers respond to new surveys. You have to find a way to differentiate yourself. Of course, you, you know this, there are 20,000 of us wandering around here. So these are the big categories that I would encourage you to start to think through when you're exploring where exactly in this trend do you want your product to sit. And I would imagine it, I would act it out, storybook it, whatever you need to do to understand uh, for yourself, for your product developers, for your supply chain, and for your sales team and marketing teams especially, know exactly who you're presenting this to. Um, when I started writing um, a podcast, we were taught to come up with an avatar and give him or her a name, a job, an age, hobbies, all of those things so I knew exactly who I was trying to serve. For me, it's a chef, restaurant chef who is looking at crossing over into R&D because we want to get off the line. We don't want to you know, miss all of the rest of the holidays for the rest of our lives. So um, that's why my podcast exists. It's to really encourage culinary professionals to come into R&D because this is an excellent way for us to use our skill sets. And we're here, it's, you know, it's a weekend, we're working, but we're having fun and I'm not wearing chef whites right now. So, okay, as you're thinking about exactly how you want to sell your product and to whom you're going to sell it, you have to think about how are you gonna make it? I met some really cool entrepreneurs today who talked about how they hand pick up all of these ingredients and they, they de-seed this and they skin that and you're like, cool, how are you gonna do that at a large scale? I understand you can do this in 50 pound batches. I understand you can do it in 100 pound kettles. But what happens if you actually get picked up by that huge retailer and now you're in 15,000 stores? 
1,500 stars, not 15,000. It feels like 15,000. You have to think about how that's going to be made. The best thing first, when you source your ingredients, only source them from suppliers who are gonna sell at industrial sizes. Do not dare go to the grocery store for those ingredients. I do realize, you know, you're like, oh, but it's paprika, like paprika, paprika. And you're like, no, there are zillions of paprikas out there. Do not start with the one that you cannot source at a large enough size, okay? Um, also think about if, if you're in a brand that's breaking into a new technology, um, you probably don't have the capabilities in-house. Are you gonna build a whole new factory for that? Maybe, or find a co-packer who can do it. Again, Specialty Food Association has a killer database if you're a member. And um, honestly, a lot of the companies here will tell you whether or not they are available to do co-packing. Um, co-packing is a great uh, way to break into a technology you haven't built the infrastructure for, but vet them so carefully. Do not rush into this. I would, I would say do not launch a product unless you know your co-packer is solid um, because the headaches that are involved after launch are so terrible. And there's nothing worse than getting to the market with something and then not being able to recreate it, right? Okay, so it feels like you've gone through the hard stuff, but now you're gonna go through the painful stuff. Talking numbers is probably the most miserable parts of owning a business. I, and I have met some financial advisors who've started food businesses and it's amazing and I'm glad they embrace the numbers. I always hate it because um, I feel like I have this vision, I have this really cool thing that people should be so excited about, you should be passionate about this. It shouldn't matter how much it costs. Doesn't your health matter more? Y yes but we still have to you know, keep our lights on and things like that. So um, these are kind of, again, the categories of numbers that you should be thinking through with your team. Again, it's cross-functional. So find out how long you actually think R&D will take and then increase that by 10, 10%. <laughs> um, same thing with costs. There are always hidden costs. So as much as our finance team hates it, I try to buff it, buffer it a little bit knowing that lab costs will be higher because you're going to expedite something, you're going to have to resend a sample, et cetera. So um, estimate high where you can. So here um, is, again, kind of four concepts that have been sticky wickets for me in the sense of, you know, do we just rush to the market and um, try to be the first guys there and, and you launch a beta? Okay, that's great in the tech world because you can just push an update and your phone goes bloop and it's, it's all updated. But in food products, as you know, we've just produced 20,000 units of this. I have to sell 20,000 units of that before I can go produce a brand new formula. And don't forget how long it takes to reformulate something. So um, again, the beta product myth, the perfection myth, that's an R&D issue, I think, where we just want to keep tweaking every time Every time I come to a trade show, I meet new suppliers, I see new technology, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I could incorporate that into this thing that I'm working on. It's like, okay, pencils down, like, like literally walk away from the bench. At some point you have to. You have to accept the fact that a version is going to get renovated. It's going to, um, you're going to get beaten in the market at some point, and then you come back again. And it's, it's that um, tug and um, push and pull. Okay couple more. <laughs> uh, consumer response, do you have CLTs worked into your project plan? Uh, consumer um, testing is so important, especially um, as you, you know, you, you can be in love with the product as much as you want to be, but we really have to know how the consumer feels about that. Um, there are central location tests that you can send your product into, and the organization that you pay will bring in panelists, they run you through a ballot, and you get data back. You can also do in-home use tests, and there are a couple of apps that are out there now um, for businesses. One that I'm exploring is Uplevo. It, I don't have a slide for them. U-P-L-E-V-O, Uplevo. Really impressive. It's, um, it's an, a phone-based app where the consumer receives your food product and then they go through a phone questionnaire. And, um, you know, and then really the data that they provide are the most important because you need to know why a consumer likes a product or why they don't and what you need to do to improve it. And then finally, through all of these things, despite all of the questions you've answered early on, remember to build in go-no-go no go points and off-ramps. 
because as this project goes along, you may find, okay, this is not the right timing, this is not the right fit, this costs way too much, we're even paying consumers to take the product, that's no good. So make sure you've built in a couple of safe points for yourself so you can step back and um, you know take that time to work on your business, not just in your business, and um, understand whether it's something worth pursuing. Um, successful R&D can also be a stopping point. And then don't forget to leverage the um, resources that you have, trade shows, professional organizations, consultants. Um, your own suppliers probably already have a lot of access to data, so you don't always have to pay for market research yourself. I'm not at all advocating for not paying for it, but if you're a small organization, leverage the supplier resources that you have. Some of the bigger suppliers that I work with um, can tell me why I should use their ingredient and here are the data for it. I always ask for data. Um, and so I would encourage you as well. Special thanks to um, you know all of the mentors and friends who've helped me get here. Sarah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, please check out the podcast, peasonmoss.net. Um, I'm on iTunes and Stitcher. And peas on moss, because it's not me all me's and plus, is it? <laughs>